Okay, finally. All right, we're back. Hello, everyone. I'm Charles Morris. Welcome to The Journey 2020. Coming to you for the very first time on a Saturday morning. And from what I understand, it's a little bit too early for a lot of us. But um, we, I'm actually teasing with the, the, the key. Um, we specifically um, move The Journey 2020 so we can have our special brother on this morning. So you're talking about a very important event. But first, let me tell you, I'm Charles Morris. Welcome to The Journey 2020. Normally, you would see Dr. Robinson at this time introducing the show. But again, for the last maybe six or seven weeks, Dr. Robinson has been extremely busy. Uh, he moved into a new building. He was very much involved with National Black AIDS Day, which was very successful. Also, uh, he's doing something with his church this morning. And I was actually called out to uh, something to do last night that was very important. But I wanted to make sure that we um, talk to Haki about his national, his annual, I'm sorry, his annual event is coming up at the end of this month. But first, I want to tell you also coming up, and I don't know if you know about this, but um, I'm setting something up for the 17th of next month, which is a Thursday. Uh, I've been talking with my aunts and the brothers, the, the five beta sigmas, will be able to come on and talk to my aunt that's 90 years old and my other aunt that's 79 years old and my cousin who spent time with my grandfather so they will get to share their stories and if there's any questions that you would like to ask personal uh Leonard Morris uh, 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 I'm getting there I'm getting there I'm getting there I'm getting there uh one of the founders of Phi Beta Sigma uh my grandfather um uh actually was born in 1891 up in Massachusetts and played a major part and uh Howard University uh, also People don't know it, but one of the main reasons that Edward Waters College exists today is because of, of my grandfather going around raising money and played a very important part in the AME Church at that time. He passed away in 1961, um, and and I just talking to my aunt. I'm gonna get on to what the, the show is about, but just talking to my aunt. Um, last week, I found out some things that I didn't know that she came into the family uh, when my uh, uncle, the, the youngest of the siblings, he was only 12 years old. So that was interesting. And she was sharing some, some uh, stories with me. So I'm excited about it as well because I got some questions that I would like to ask. And she was sharing some things with me. In addition to that, we're also going to have uh, in the future, and I've been talking about it for the past couple of weeks, and that is Lucille O'Neill coming on. She's going to talk about her book, Walk Like You Got Somewhere to Go. And another one of my friend, Melba, um, she's coming on to talk about her book, uh, A White Man's Woman, where uh, her mother was molested and had kids where uh, some white men raped her. And that they was, you know, there was nothing that you can do about it. That it but she's going to bring a mother on to talk about the book as well. And so with that, I have my guest here to... to oh, <laughs> You know, I, 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 I have my guests, and actually, I guess I should uh, make sure that you're on camera. Oh, yeah. There you go. All right. Got to make sure you're on camera. I want to welcome you. Um, Haki. Good morning. Nkrumah, right? Did I, did I get it right this time? Nkrumah. In, Nkrumah. Okay. Nkrumah. Okay. Well, welcome to the journey 2020. Welcome to the journey 2020. Um, won't you tell us, for those who have, have uh, this is their first time t tuning in, I did put the word out last night, uh, I'm sorry, yesterday evening that I sent out uh, on my email list and also put it on Facebook, that you would be here this morning okay. and talking about the wonderful things that you're doing and that you've been doing for a while. Now, you came here from New York, right? Yes. Now, were you born in New York? Yes, I was, I was born upstate. Okay, so you are, you're a New Yorker. <laughs> Well, actually, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, I, I teased, but I actually went to school in Boston for some, some time. And so in doing that time, I spent a lot of time in New York, Jersey, and Boston. And because of the connection I had, uh, somebody who was close to me worked for Amtrak. So I got to rat, ride Amtrak for free every other weekend. Go from Boston to New York, take that four hour trip, boom. Hey, hey, trust me, I took advantage of it. But for a period of about, I would say uh, maybe 12, about 12 years, maybe 12, 13 years, 
the, the, the very next day after Christmas, I was up in New York. And I would stay there till about two days after New Year's and would come back. So I did that for about like 12 years and would go to New York maybe about, maybe four times during the year for a period of about maybe 10 years. Right. Yeah. And so it, it and, and, and the reason why I make the joke is because there was some of like the, the Boston people were, they nicknamed me Grits. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I actually tell that story. The reason, one of the main reasons why they nicknamed me Grits, they were just fascinated that I put hot sauce on French fries. They just thought that was the weirdest thing. They'd be, that, that must be a southern thing that you put hot sauce on french fries. And to me, I thought everybody put hot sauce on, 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 on french fries, but they just thought that was the weirdest thing. So one of, the, one of the guys that I played ball with, he just nicknamed me Grits. Man, man, Grits, what's up with the hot sauce on the french fries? Because I'm mean, <laughs> from, from southern, you know, from South Florida. I mean, I mean not from South Florida, but from the South. They associate the grits with the South, so, they, so he nicknamed me Grits. So I was what like, people uh, don't realize is that a lot of people in New York, uh -huh. particularly in Harlem, uh -huh. areas like that, a lot of those people are, are, are Southern. Uh -huh. So when people see those type of things, grits in New York, it's not unfamiliar with them. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot of people, a lot of people, you go to Harlem, get something that does fried chicken, greens, black eyed peas, and rice. Mm -hmm. You get some of the best in Harlem, okay. so New York period, because a lot of people migrated from the South up North, because my mother is from Georgia, my father, father's from Alabama, mm -hmm. and they migrated up to upstate New York. Okay. Go figure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't you tell us about, um, I mean, <coughs> you, you, you was born in New York, and uh, how did you end up coming to Florida? Well, well, why don't you tell us what you started up in New York and, then, and what you brought to Florida? Well, I actually started um, in undergrad school. I started working with young fathers because mm -hmm. part of the fraternity, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, um, we had to do community service. Mm -hmm. And my community service, I wanted to work with the youth. Mm -hmm. And But what I found is that I kept coming across young dads. Okay. And I noticed that they didn't have any services and they were, they were pretty much being ignored. All right. Um, so I started working with them in undergrad school. I graduated. I went into the military. And while I was stationed in Korea, I noticed that a lot of fathers had a difficult time dealing with the separation. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you were an officer and, you were, and your orders wasn't to stay for more than one or two years, you couldn't bring your family over. So a lot of guys, it was tough and difficult for them. So I actually started the father support group. Mm -hmm. And back then, you know, it wasn't, you can't just jump on the internet. So, yeah, so, right. we, would, so we would have le letter writing sessions where we would get together and write letters to their children. So I actually started then. Okay. <laughs> and then when I came back to the States, I started up a fatherhood program and did that for years. Mm -hmm. um, so I relocated here to Florida. Well, 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 well let's go back to um, then. How was it perceived back then? And, and talk about some of your early struggles, because even now you, you still struggle with, with, with some of the things that we know that you do. But, but how was it starting out, and what was your first true struggle starting out? Just people perceiving young men, young fathers, as perpetrators, as something evil. Like they went and got this innocent young girl pregnant. You know, and so the, the the perception of young fathers was just so negative. But most part, for the for the most part, they just ignored them. They acted as though they weren't there, that they didn't exist. Especially for the really young ones, the 15 to 16 year old ones, they really ignored them. But under the age of 24, period, they just pretty much ignored them, acted as though they don't exist, and. The program or organization, we were first funded by a foster care agency mm -hmm. called Forestdales in Queens. Um, and their director, and, that's, and Forestdale is one of the oldest foster care agency, agencies in the country. Mm -hmm. And Miss, Miss Bailey, I remember her, she was so feisty and she was so little and she just was like a terror. And she wanted to allocate funds for, for a program working with 
Tina Young Father. So she was the first one that I ever met that was concerned mm -hmm. that these young men were absent in their children's lives. Right. And little bitty white lady, mm -hmm. Jewish white lady, and she was um, she was so serious about it that she put up money and funded the program. Mm -hmm. So just like I said, she's the first one that, that I've ever come in contact with that wanted to allocate funds because 95% of the funds, well, no, let me not say that, 100% uh, of the funds <laughs> that were for young parents always went to young mothers. Okay. That's why to this very day in the state of Florida, I have the only 501c3 nonprofit that focuses on services for teen and young fathers, the only one in this entire state. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this conference that we're doing, um, because the first conference I went that dealt with young men um, was in London, England mm -hmm. in 2010. And there had never been a young fathers conference in this country. So we started the first national teen and young fathers conference in 2013. So this would be our fourth conference. Okay. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this conference is to help all those little small teen and young father organizations across the country who think they're the only one that, that exists and to just develop a strong networking, um, a network, and also um, educate each other on how to get funding to support the organization because people just giving money to an organization, especially as they perceive young black men, young black perpetrators, mm -hmm. deviants, they're not giving them money. You know what? I'm going to take you off topic just for a second. And uh, I think one of the, I'm going to give you my own personal opinion on something, which I find, uh, I, th I think it's kind of, I think it's part of just being naive and, and part of a stereotype. Uh, I could be 18 years old and talking to a girl that's 16 and the parents find out that we're having sex and they will arrest me mm -hmm. basically for statutory rape. Mm -hmm. In some states. Right. What blows my mind is that the parent will never look at the part the daughter plays. Never. They won't acknowledge that she may have even been the aggressor. They won't acknowledge that it's really not him. Because mm -hmm. if it's not going to be him, it's going to be somebody else. Right. So they're not dealing with what the true problem is. But they're able to point the finger over there and blame something or somebody for something that they're not acknowledging. Mm -hmm. And that always blows my mind that you can do that. As if though this 18-year-old. This Force this, this person who's 16, mm -hmm. and the parents are going, okay, I'm not quite sure what that's about. You, I'm not quite sure because, now you done got rid of him, mm -hmm. which is really not the problem. Majority of the time, because again, if it's not going to be him, it's going to be somebody, which means that they're really not really coping with what the issues are. Mm -hmm. And that just blows my mind that you could be so naive that you're really not helping. Right. And, what? You, and you're really destroying another person's life because mm -hmm. of whatever that is, whatever that disconnect is, there's, there's, there's something wrong with that. And that just bothers me, especially it, since it I blows know how, your mind. Especially <laughs> since I know how aggressive girls were, <laughs> and now even more so. But just think about what you just said. You said an 18-year-old boy. You know, I'm, just think about how many cases I come across where the boy is 16 and the girl is 18. Okay. Nothing ever happens to her. <laughs> Never. And, and even still, they look at him like he's a deviant predator. Even then, it, I have so many cases where, and, and, and I would say close to half the cases where the young women are older than these young men. Okay. So, but they're but, never but, looked at as but, being perpetrators. But that's my point that I'm trying to make. But, and, 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 and what I'm trying to say is, is that how the parents, I'm trying to figure out what that is that's going on inside the uh, head that you get the, as if though you're blaming something, you're fixing a problem, uh -huh. but you're not. Chuck, a lot of, most often, the par it's something going on with them, themselves, the parents. And for example, the 12-year-old 
uh, mother right. and father. You okay. remember I was telling you about that? Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I know the story, but you got to share the story because there's some people that don't know that story. Yeah, um, a 12 year old boy, 12 year old girl. Mm -hmm. The girl is pregnant, and the parents were fighting because the young boy's mother wanted to raise the child, but the young girl mm -hmm. parents didn't want to raise the child. Right. So the two sides were fighting over what was going to happen. They wanted to put the, the young lady's um, um, parents wanted to put the child up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So the young, the young man's mom, mom asked me why did they hate her so much, Right. the other parents. I said, well, they don't really hate you. you know, they don't know you. Um, but she said, why are they the way they are? Why do they want to do that? Because you know, I told her, I said, the stigma, the it, shame, it could, yeah, the stigma, the shame, and the, and the shame, them feeling, the and them feeling that they failed their, their child, like, like, you know, she's 12 years old. How does she get pregnant? Right. Then come to find out, after all the dirt was 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 off, that the girl was having sex since she was 10. And so the mother felt like they actually failed the daughter. So it's not that, that they hated this other woman. It's just that they, right. they looked at themselves as being failures. Like, why is our child pregnant at this particular age? So that's what happens a lot. But, the, but it's always, in, in this society, there is always looked at as the young man is this perpetrator that's right. running around with his thing out, <laughs> running around the community like a dog. Right. And that's what... And, Chuck, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they're black either, because right. whenever people see that we work with white kids and, and I'm telling you, when the first Asian walked through that door, everyone looked like, oh, my God, like, what does the world come to? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's funny. Not knowing, not knowing, realize there's more Asians <laughs> in this world. Right. So so it's like it's just a stigma. And 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 even the men. Uh huh. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I would say 70% of all funds that we've collected in donations come from women. Right. Come from women. Um, I have more women asking to volunteer than men. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to get it. We, we, won't, we won't get into that subject now because that, that's the subject that made me angry. And it's in the morning. It's, it's early, man. I don't, I don't, I don't want to get angry. You know, I'm, I'm used to doing this at 7 o'clock, so I know I could go to sleep after. <laughs> no, but, but, but that angers me, the, the lack of interests that men have and in particularly black men because but, but, majority okay, of our guys are okay well then let me well i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna stir up your anger a little bit <laughs> okay do you <laughs> bro that no, no 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 do you think that is one of the reasons why the struggle is so because of how we come across who us. Black black men, right? Absolutely, right? Absolutely, black black men to me, you know, uh, have been beaten down so long mm -hmm. and for you know for so many different reasons right. that when they finally, as quote unquote, make it, right. there's no obligation to there, there's no. I mean, just look at like organizations like the Hundred Black Men. Right. What the hell is that? Okay. I mean, I'm not disrespecting them, but the Hundred Black Men, Hundred. Can't be 101. <laughs> Can't be 102. Right. That got to be the dumbest damn thing in the world to me personally. I'm I'm just personal, and you know, and some some. There's organizations we've never gotten help from. Okay. Let's let's look at the fraternities and sorority. People always tell me to go to them. Majority of funds and support we've gotten uh -huh. was from the sororities. Okay. Not the not the fraternities, and this is just a reality, Chuck. This is just reality, mm -hmm. and we're we're supposed to be the leaders. Right. In our community, we're supposed to be the protectors of our families, and we're just abandoning these little boys, right. these young men. We just abandon them as though they don't exist. Mm -hmm. My first book was titled Young Fathers, The Forgotten. Right. They're forgotten. And even in London in 2010, the Young Fatherhood Conference, their theme was, of the conference, not so invisible. Okay. You understand? Right. Our young fathers are walking around these communities as though they don't exist. And I can go a whole year and not get a dime uh -huh. from black, or black male organizations, black males. You know, of course they sprinkle in. Right. You know what I mean? But, yeah. but the women, the only, the, the, the only time that I felt a sense of pride was when, you know, most people know I'm a Sigma. Mm -hmm. And the alphas, 
Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity mm -hmm. Incorporated. Mm -hmm. They gave a regional, um, I think it was like a regional um, 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 meeting or convening, uh -huh. and it was in Orlando, Florida last year. And um, they donate money to two organizations, nonprofits, mm -hmm. whenever they come to a city, whenever they visit a city. And we were one of the organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, Reggie McGill, who's the right. alpha out of the city of Orlando, right. he nominated us and so forth, said this organization we've been working with for years because we're in our 10th year. Right. So we're not, you know, some Johnny come lately. And they donate, donated $6,000 mm -hmm. to the organization. That was so significant because the alpha, those brothers said, because it has nothing to do with me being a Sigma, but right. some people would look at it like that. People even asked me after we got the donation, hey, I thought you and Ruben were Sigmas. We didn't know you were alphas. <laughs> right. I said, um, we are sigmas. But didn't the alphas give you a donation? Yeah. Because it had nothing to do with what fraternity I was in. Right. It had to do with the work that we're doing. Well, and that well, made me proud. That made me proud. And I'm telling you, my Facebook page blew up after that because people were confused. They were so confused that this, this black organization gave money to another organization. We're not in particularly a black organization, but the leadership is. Uh -huh. And... And so they view that as like, wow, th that's so unusual. That's how bad it is, where, where it becomes unusual for one organization of black men to support a, another organization. Well, see, the thing is, I mean, people, uh, like, for an example, uh, I have had people come to me, young, young, young men, and ask me, well, should I pledge, should I pledge, you know, Phi Beta Sigma? And I said, you need to do your homework mm -hmm. and you need to do your research mm -hmm. and figure out what you should do. And I said, the bottom line of it shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just do your homework and, right. it, and where you feel comfortable, because if they're doing what they're supposed to do, right. it shouldn't matter. Right. And, and, and <laughs> it's also when, I, when guys ask me that young, young men, right. whatever, whatever campus you want, like right. every campus, all sigmas are not the same. Right. All Alphas right, are not the right. same. That's what I say. All, Do your homework. Yeah. Every so, for example, I pledged the fraternity. I pledged because the brothers around me at that campus, they were thorough. Right. They were together. Right. The others were not. Okay. So you could go to another campus, and some people have traditions like they, they their father was a certain right. fraternity, or, but it's where you are and what those brothers are doing on that particular campus. That's what I tell the young brothers. People people look at it differently, but um. You know, but it just sometimes, because people are always telling me, go to the fraternities, go to the fraternities. You go to fraternities, they act like you don't, ex they act like you don't exist when it comes to that. But then the sororities, it's almost as though those sisters, those women, because all, all, you know, there's no such thing as a black fraternity or sorority anymore. But it's, you know, it's like they see it, they get it. They right. say, okay, we're talking about the survival of our children. You know, that's why it's important for these young men to be involved in these children's lives, right. period. Well, it, well, period. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, mean, that's, that, I mean, that goes without saying, mm -hmm. you know, because that's the way it works. That's the way mm -hmm. it's supposed to work. And it's just amazing that we have this attitude, and it's really how we feel about ourselves. The, a, absolutely. There, there you go right there. Right. It's, how you, it's, it's exactly how we feel about ourselves. It's like I ask guys all the time. You know, what organization are you giving your time to? You know, are you volunteering any time? Are you mentoring anyone? Right. Anyone. To me, as a black man, if you do not spend any of your time mm -hmm. trying to, as they say, give back. Right. I don't call it giving back. I call it giving forward. Right. If you don't have any time to do that, and I know, God, oh, I got my own family. I got my good you're more of an example then because you're actually raising a family. And so our dad to dad mentoring program where we match an older father with a younger father, that's meaningful to me because it's helping these young men see what it is to be a father, mm -hmm. especially seeing what it is to be a black man in society. And even our kids that have money, our white kids and, and, and you know, um, Hispanic kids, all these other kids, black kids, white kids, Hispanic, mm -hmm. some have money, some don't. Right. But there's, there's this one kid that we worked with, with for years, um, millionaire daddy. Right, right. But his daddy never spent any time with him. Right. So he had a parent there, but 
He had no example right. because his parent, his father was gone all the time, didn't pay any attention to him. So he grew up fatherless. Right. You yeah. know, it's just right. like the young boy who parents who, who father just left. Mm -hmm. That's almost worse. Right. Because, you know, when the father leaves, then there's, you know, um, father figures in their lives. Right. But when this father's still present over here, father figure is not able to get in that, you know, dynamic. So right. it's like that kid is, is, is being raised by his mom. But see, we can talk about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, we, I get into these discussions and it's, this, this is part of the uh, discussions and it goes back to uh, just life and who we are in the culture. Because I, this is what I said. Do you ever really want to understand who we are? I said, just go back to Adam and Eve and what was in the garden. Mm -hmm. And that's how we were intend to relate to each other. Now, once we step out of the garden and we put all these other things to the forefront, mm -hmm. that doesn't have any meaning that we have now brought meaning to. Because we need each other as a family and as a village. And that's the way it was supposed to be. But that's not how it is. Something as simple as understanding your role as a parent. Mm -hmm. But when you when your role that you play is, you think that, well, because I bring in money or because I go over here and do this, then I don't have to do this. But the essential things that's really important, even though you need the money, of course, through the, the important things in the sense of how you touch your child, communicate with your child, mm -hmm. doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the... Uh, 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 something that we really fail to, I mean, a lot of us struggle with because we look at it from a material standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then, like, for an example, there's so much to that that you got mothers who don't understand how important, because there's and, uh, fathers as well, they're so angry with, uh, with their mate that it's about them, not about what's best for the child, I don't want you to see my child because I'm pissed off at you, not understanding what you're doing to the child. Mm -hmm. And it works both both ways. And now whatever issues you got with me, why are you taking it out on the child? Because that's really what you're doing. Now the child going to have issues later right. on in life simply right. because of what you're doing now. Right. <laughs> you know, not understanding the importance of having the mother figure, not understanding the importance of having the father figure. So it's just so much a so many dynamics or so many different things are something that we don't understand that is so simple because we make it so personal mm -hmm. about our emotions and about our feelings when we should be able to be mature enough and be like, oh, it's it's kind of like being on a basketball team. As I'm going to say it like this or a sports team where I don't like you, but we can play together to win. Mm -hmm. And when the game's over, you go your way, I go my way. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying I don't have to like you, but you are the father of my child. Right. Uh, you're my mother. We need to do what's in best interest for this child. you going right into the theme of the conference. The, <laughs> the theme of our conference is co-parenting. Oh, really? Absolutely. That's, that's, that's what the theme is because, um, you know, I'm a certified family mediator. Okay. So right. I medi I'm professionally, I do mediation. And what you just said, I hear it all the time, the, the emotion that comes out of those sessions. Right. I mean... There's one, there's one couple recently that I was working with. Um, I mean, there was just a lot of anger there between oh, yeah. the both of them. Right. And they're going back and forth in mediation, things that had nothing to do with what's important at that time right. with that decision, the decisions they had to make. Mm -hmm. And so I just asked the woman if she had any pictures of her kids. And I asked him, Is he, did he have any pictures? And they both pulled out pictures. And I just put them in the middle of the table and said, now, what is this all about? Is this all about you? Is this all about you? Or is it about the children? I made them look at the pictures. And I told them, I said, just like I tell everyone I mediate, my job is here to help you come up with an acceptable agreement. Mm -hmm. If you don't come up with an agreement, guess who's going to do it? The judge. The judge don't know you. He don't care about you. He don't know your child, your, your children. And he don't care about them. He just cared about making a decision, doing his job. So if you're not going to be an adult, if you're not going to be adults, adult enough to make a decision, who knows your children better than you, I asked him. Right. You two know your children better than anyone. This man here, this judge, he don't know your children. He don't know which one of your kids, 
love Halloween because they love candy so much. He don't know which one of your kids love Thanksgiving. Right. He don't, he don't know anything about your children. You do. So who's better equipped to make a decision than you two? Yeah, and plus, well, the whole idea that you're putting it, putting it in somebody else's hands. Yeah, and, and that's, the, that's the thing I said. So if you, if you don't love your children enough to be an adult enough to make a, 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 come up with, you know, an agreement, who's getting which child at what time of year or how many days, all of you guys have to decide that. Or right. you two guys have to decide that, not the judge. Because right. the judge is just, a, it's just some paper in front of him. So you're absolutely right. Uh, too much anger comes in. So the reason that um, we wanted this conference thing to be co-parenting is because throughout the last few years, we get more cases in that area mm -hmm. than any other case. Co-parenting, well, well, yeah. dealing with each other right. yeah, for, yeah. The, for, the, for yeah. the benefit of the child. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, 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 I hate you. I, <laughs> you know, I hate you. But the, the whole thing, now that's a whole nother thing which there's some things that I've learned because I get into these discussions with a lot of my female friends. Mm -hmm. And over the years, there's things that I have learned mm -hmm. and the difference in the, in the whole process and how women think and how we think. So I've learned a lot that I used to be surprised about that I'm, I'm not surprised anymore because over the years, I, I have learned. Now, I would love to do Uh, I would love at one of your conferences mm -hmm. for us to have a discussion, mm -hmm. a man-woman discussion, where the the women get to come in and ask us questions, and I would direct it in the sense of just who we are. Chuck, we don't have to do it ever at a conference. We could put that together ourselves. Well, well so let's well, do it. Well, well, well let's that's do what it. I mean. Let's in, let's in, do in, it. In, in, the more you talk to women, in my experience, it's just like you don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I say. You have an image in your mind. And everything that you do portrays to that image. And that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. You are portraying who you want me to be. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the time when I'm talking to my friends, and this is this is... Nine out of ten times, mm -hmm. I'm on the phone, and they're talking from anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes to an hour. Mm -hmm. And now I said, okay, you just spent all this time talking about who you want him to be. This conversation is not about who he is. Mm -hmm. Everything you said is about who you want him to be. Right, right. You ain't said nothing about who he is. Uh -huh. And they, that's part for them that part that they don't quite understand but Chuck it all goes down to how we how we select our well partners well, that's the whole point of what right. I'm trying to get yep. to how we say that's why I'm saying until you understand who I am right and you're trying to make me be somebody that I'm not mm -hmm. because you think that well if I if I feel this way or mm -hmm. if I show him this type of feeling if I love him this way uh, then this will be this and this will be that it could be a lot of things, mm -hmm. but at least know who I am right. and understand my nature. I'm not asking you to accept anything other than understand who I am. And they have a heart because as I'm telling you, I've learned this. Mm -hmm. You sit there and you have the conversation. And I've experienced it about, <laughs> about 200 times. Right, right. And you kind of break down men and who we are. Uh -huh. You come back two minutes later. That person ain't heard nothing you said. Nothing. Because it doesn't fit the image who they think we are. That's right. And That's they right. it just doesn't it doesn't go anywhere. Whenever I speak to young young women, I'm, you know, I, I speak to them just like young guys. And I always ask them, and they cause they ask me, Mr. Haki, well why why he, you know, he get me pregnant and he <laughs> act like I don't wanna be like he don't wanna be with me or whatever. And I just ask them, you know, what's 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 his favorite color? Like what's his shoe size? Right. That's your baby father. I just asked him a series of basic questions. I said, you know, you ladies can't meet these guys Friday, having sex with them Saturday or maybe Sunday, because you were told don't give them none the next day, so you'll give them some the following day. Right. 
and you get pregnant and you expect for him to love you a little Ray Ray, a little <laughs> Malcolm. Right. He don't know you. Right. You don't know him. Right. And then I tell the young guys, man, she's a bitch and blah, blah, she did, you know. I said, boy, you had sex with her without a condom, didn't you? Right. So, and you didn't know anything about her. You call her a crazy bitch now. Well, she was a crazy bitch when you had sex with her. <laughs> right. If she's that, right? Right. right. But you didn't take any time to know anything about her. Right. All you saw was that butt, and you said, I got to get that. Right. And this girl saw him. Mm. Ooh, look, at he he cute. Right. So I'm going to give him some. Both of you sat there and made decisions that you were going to have a sex with someone you knew nothing about without a condom. And dealing with the consequences. Yeah, yeah. those consequences. So that's why when we talk about co-parenting, I always break it down to that. That's... You two made a decision that night, right? Mm -hmm. You took off your drawers, you took off your drawers, and y'all did what y'all did, mm -hmm. right? So now, neither one of you want to be responsible for it. Right. You're responsible for it now, the same way you made that decision to do that. So that's why when we work with our young men and we talk about healthy choices, those are, one of the, those, those are the things. Now, you know if you smoke a little weed, you get... Freaky. Mm -hmm. You know, if you drink a little brew, you get freaky. Well, why are you going to this girl, smoke with this girl, smoking weed, drinking, and then the next day you're always blaming it on the drugs? <laughs> <laughs> the drugs made me do it. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the decisions <laughs> that they make, that's why when we work with these young men and, and young women, you make this decision. Unless that boy raped you, you made a decision to take those drugs off or let him do it. So don't blame it on anyone else. You have to own up to that. And this child, and the way our society is, for the most part, if you get pregnant, you're going to raise that child for the most part. There's a lot of situations where we have young girls that, you know, they're, they're with their boyfriends. Because every case of teen parenting, every case is not like that where, you know, they're not with each other, they don't love each other. Some of these kids love each other. It's the when you meet these kids, meet each other, and you don't even know anything about them. Some of these kids, they grow up with the girl or boy, so they know about them, they know their families. You know, I'm not saying that that's acceptable for them just to go have children when they're not, when they're not prepared. Right. But you got adults who have children when they're not prepared. You got adults oh, yeah, running around here doing the same grown folks <laughs> with children. Right. See each other. Bam. Right. right. Then I mean, the baby there, and then all of a sudden, oh, now nah, she's going to put me on child support. <laughs> really? <laughs> Bro, you put yourself on child yeah, support. You, yeah. <laughs> You're right, because <laughs> I know when my brother got Come somebody on, man. pregnant, man, my brother got somebody pregnant, and they came looking for him. I said, he right over there. <laughs> That's right. He, 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 That's right. He's right over there is, is what I did. You Child know? support just like just you like know, taxes. I, I they said, you know, they'll let it accumulate on oh, you too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, just yeah. like the IRS, oh, yeah. they'll let you accumulate and you think, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm getting away with that. No, oh, well, Child see, support do the same thing. Oh they sit back. <laughs> a few years later, he came to me. He said, Guess what? I was like, What? I owe twenty thousand dollars in, in back child support. I said, Really? I looked at him like uh, Oh, good. <laughs> so when those brothers come to me, ask, talk, talk about, especially the older brother, talk right. about they owe twenty, thirty thousand dollars in back child support. I said, bro, I can't do nothing for you. Right. I but, can do nothing because if you allowed that to happen, that's such an irresponsible man. I, I mean, I just look at him like, bro, I ain't got nothing. Oh, oh, I thought you um help brothers. <laughs> look at that sign. That's a young father, Central Florida. Your ass forty two, and owing thirty thousand dollars in back child support. Bro, I ain't got nothing for you. Right. I ain't got nothing for you. And some guys don't like me for that, man. They like, oh, you only work with certain people. You only work with them little. I was like, absolutely. Because they're ill-equipped. A lot of times, they're adolescents. You're a grown man. Right. You're 40 years old. You're a grown man. And you owe $30,000 back child support. Bruh, I ain't got nothing for you. I have nothing for you. You, What you need to do is you need to get yourself a job. If you don't, I'll give you some referrals. You don't have a job. I'll give you some referrals. Right. And you need to go, are you seeing your child at least? When the last time you seen your child? Right. Oh, I don't know. You know his mama. <laughs> you know his mama. I don't get along. 
You see, you see, see, but see, that's what <laughs> makes it so sad. But then, when but it's just so much trifle, they so trifling on both ends. And, and, a, and a mother can't be a trifling woman. I'm not saying when he say that, but that ain't got nothing to do with you and your right. child. Right. We can arrange it where you ain't got to see this trifling woman if that's what she is. But for the most part, why why is she trifling? You're not finding, you're not helping her financially. If it, if you owe thirty thousand dollars, that means you haven't been helping her for a long time. Right. So she's been dealing with that all these years. Right. So if she's trifling because of that, so damn what? I'll be trifling too. <laughs> yeah. You know, and especially if you are not even seeing your child. Look, 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 child. A lot of men in this, you know, in our society have issues. Right. A lot of them drug problems. Right. Mental problems, a lot of problems. Right. But you don't abandon your child. Don't don't abandon this child. Right. I even tell when I went to Coleman Penitentiary, the brothers there, mm -hmm. uh, they asked me to come speak, and some of these brothers got a hundred, two hundred years. Right. Oh yeah, I've I've I've, I've done a whole. And lot I told them, I, I said, I don't care if you got three hundred years, you still a daddy. I asked the brother, how old was your child when you came in here? She was two. I said, how many years you been in? 10 years. I said, is your child two or the child 12? Right. The child didn't stop living. Right. <sighs> yeah, yeah. They have you written? Have you done anything? Your child has milestones in their lives. Mm -hmm. You should be there whether you locked up or not. Right. You know, unless you were some crazy, you know, um, child molester and, and mass murderer. But you get what I'm saying. Oh, you, yeah, you, you oh, know, yeah. they, they sti but, you still but, have the obligations. But, so but, but, whether but, you're in jail or whether you're on but, 33rd Street. But most of us are not that mature uh, or even understand the responsibility because it it's stuff like that that the effect will go year after year and it's mm -hmm. hard to even break that cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's why we do what we do, man. Chuck. That's why you we know? do what we do. It's too important for our children. You know, and people say, "Well, why, why you know so many, so much statistics about children and babies and all that, bro?" That's what I do. Right. Young fathers in Central Florida, all our guys have children. I don't care so much about this this guy here. I'm trying to get him in a position where he's taking care of his his child, whether it's financially, whether it's his time being you know. there. You know what you didn't do? Mm -hmm. You didn't really say what Young Fathers of Central Florida is. You need to say that. Young Fathers of Central Florida, we opened our doors in 2006. Um, guys used to bet, because I was coming from New York, didn't know one person in the entire state. They were betting. This, this brother coming from New York trying to start a father's program with some young teen guys. Mm -hmm. He ain't going to last a year, right. two years. They was betting them. Guys I know now, they tell me, man, we used to bet on you, Aki. <laughs> we used to bet that you wouldn't last two or three years. So we started working with, um, we mainly had a father support group first, so we started slow, and, and um, now we have seven programs from everything from dad to dad mentoring, parent training, father support groups. We have a Young Father Institute. Um, we started at Bethune-Cookman. Um, we don't have it there any longer, but we started it there. Um, we have um, Teen Fatherhood Academy, which is a program for fathers in high school. We have a program called Gents the Gentlemen. Mm -hmm. That's for our, those guys are not fathers yet, but it's a um, development program for nine to 13 year old boys. And what's sad about that is that there's like a year waiting list for that program. Wow. Um, yeah, I'll never forget the first time we had it at Jackson Community Center. Uh -huh. And I told them that we were gonna have, um, you know, like 15 kids. Uh -huh. Man, so many different Families would call from all parts of the city about the program at Jackson, you know. Um, and then we did a um, we we did like a family um, um, recruitment at at Callahan. Mm -hmm. Man, all these people, there were so many people, and it's you know, a lot of women wanted something for their young, you know, their sons to do right. and be involved in because it, it was character, etiquette, and development. Right. You know, um, a lot of history. The, the the one day that always make me happy is when we do our session on um, famous inventors, famous black inventors. Right, right, right. Man, those little boys, they come out of that room with their chest up high, you know, looking, talking about, look, 
you know, the doorknob and the, the you know, the light and the, you know, right. it just, it's just all in, in George Washington Carver. When he, you hear little boy talk about George Washington Carver, you know, like he's a, a some, someone like LeBron James, uh -huh. that's what I want these boys to understand. That whether it's soap, shampoo, you know, all the stuff we can right. run down at. Right. In our daily lives, we use, and these young men associated with a black man, it, it just makes me feel good um, to do that. But we provide any supportive services to fathers under the age of 24. We don't necessarily work with fathers older than 24, but we'll give them referrals, like that 40-year-old brother owing $30,000 who say he, who <laughs> say he don't have a job. Right. Like we'll give them a referral, uh -huh. um, but we don't really, they can't be in any of our programs. Our program, but for those young men, who we feel that uh, are more isolated and ignored in our society. Mm. And in 2009, I did a survey at an international fatherhood conference where there were like 800 practitioners. And I asked the question of, um, at what age does your organization begin engaging fathers? Mm. And, they, and the age was 26 years old. And to me, that was shocking because that means we're giving our young fathers over 10 years to be absent and dysfunctional fathers before we even engage them. But I understand why they do it because there's more money working with older fathers. Oh, right. Well, that's you, always the key. There's more money working with older <laughs> fathers when you know because younger fathers and younger fathers, you know, politicians don't care about them too much because they don't vote. They can't vote. Okay. Child support don't care much about them because they don't pay child support, especially when you got seven out of ten of them employed anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to work with young fathers because they're young uh -huh. and dumb. Right. A lot of them, right? Yeah. You know what I'm? They, right. they, they're naive, right. they're ignorant. You know, I won't right. call them. You know, I ain't gonna call them up just dumb, but you well, know what I well, mean. Well, that's what you mean. In yeah, that's exactly of, what I mean. That yeah, they're, that's they're exactly what I mean. Naive, not in the sense of dumb. I mean, <laughs> right. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So you know, there, there's no, and that's why I work with them. That's right. the, that's the main reason I work with them because, you know, for some reason I've always had the ability to get across right. to them. You know, to to help them understand what they need to know to be responsible fathers. And the older guys show up. You have a child support meeting, uh -huh. those older guys all be there. Younger ones won't. Right. So that's why a lot of organizations across the country, they say they don't even bother working with teen and young fathers. That's why there's so few of us, and that's the purpose of this conference, is to get those organizations across the country that work with teen and young fathers to help them understand that they're not the only one out there. Because no matter where I go, it could be in Mississippi, it could be in California, they always think they're the only one. Okay, break the conference down for us. Go, go. The conference, the conference is 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 designed for educators, uh -huh. you know, whether they're teachers, professors, counselors, um, social workers, um, law enforcement, healthcare providers, healthcare professionals. All those individuals who come in contact with teen and young fathers, because I've found that um, across the board, most of those people who come across these young fathers, they know they don't know how to engage them, they don't know how to support them. A lot of them don't know what resources are available for them locally, statewide, or nationally. They just don't work with them. They don't deal with them. And it's sad when you get a lot of home visitors with a lot of these agencies that go into homes. Mm -hmm. I won't name the particular agency, one of the largest agencies in the state that hired me to do um, consulting work with them for um, their fatherhood initiative. I mean, I met with about 40 of them, and I asked how many of them actually engage fathers when they go in the house. And you had like 38, don't do it. So they go in the home, and they just speak to the mom. They don't really speak to the dad. You know, so a lot of these practitioners and law enforcement, a lot of those people, they just don't know how to engage fathers. Well, so that's what the conference is for. Um, we have we have people as far north as Connecticut, Harvard, Connecticut, coming to this conference. Um, Philadelphia, uh -huh. um, as far west as Albuquerque, New Mexico, mm -hmm. Houston, Texas, Miami, San Diego, Sac um, um, South South Carolina, Washington D.C. So we have people coming from across the country, and the conference is, is getting larger. The largest international fatherhood conference, this, they're in their 16th year. Last year, they had 16 states wow. come to the conference. We're in our fourth year, and we have 10. Okay. So that tells you the, the, the speed in which we're growing. Okay. One of the other things, too, that uh, 
you can think about in the future is that um, we can also stream it where they people can interact. Yeah, we, you know, I always want to do that because you always mention that. <laughs> you know, you always mention that, but we just never get to doing it. Right. But so, you know, the conference is a two-day conference, um, mm -hmm. and you know, um, it's eighty dollars for one day, mm -hmm. one fifty for two days. Mm -hmm. um, just like I was talk, telling the guy the other day, he he said, "Man, I can't come." I said, "Sponsor with Father Day." I said, you know, we went to play golf and you spent $150 with, on, on, on one round, nine holes, you know what I mean? Right. Treating the guys and, you know, just being the big shot, be a big shot and, and um, sponsor a father then if right. you can't be there. Right. You know, $150 right. for two days or one day, $80. Right. And it's the most inexpensive conference that we know of that, that works with fathers, okay. you know, in this country. Um, so, you know, it's, you know uh, we have speakers, we're going to have um, speakers, we have what we call speed networking, people always love that where we, because a lot of, a, a lot of conferences I've attended, whether it's a two, three day conference, there's people that's not extroverted people, they'll come to that conference for two or three days and speak to maybe four people. Right. You know what I mean? All these people, because they're just not an extroverted person. So we, we do speed networking where each everyone gets a chance to s speak at least for five minutes with at least 20 people in that conference at that conference one-on-one -on -one. right yeah talk yeah. about what they do the success that they have you know that's yeah. what we that's why we want to develop that strong network okay and give 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 the date of the conference february 25th and 26th that's next thursday and friday okay and give give your number or in, in my work. contact information um, our office is 407-423-9400 my cell phone you can reach me on 917-517-2662 that's 917-517-2662 give you web uh, address. and and our and our website is youngfathersofcentralflorida.com hey. youngfathersofcentralflorida.com you can go on there. You can register there for the conference. You can get more or, more information on what the organization offers, the programs. Um, I feel proud to always say we're in our 10th year. Mm -hmm. So we work with thousands of fathers throughout the years nationwide. Oh, yeah. um, we have in June what's called Father's Week. The, we started Father Week in Orlando um, nine years ago. Now it's in 32 cities across the country. Oh, where, really? where they Where they where there's a week-long activity right. leading up to Father's Day. It's the same time every, every right. year. Yeah. And we, we have days, workshops each day. It, everything from mentoring to employment, education, father's rights, responsible fatherhood. We do a, um, a little um, picnic carnival for the, for the kids on that Saturday. Then we do a Sunday, we do a Father's Day dinner. Uh, yeah, I, I I I like the information because it's very very informative, especially to to help those men better cope with the system. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times they're caught up in the system because they don't know the do's and the don'ts. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I was just thinking about one of my old friends who was actually uh, I was he. He was married for about 18, 20 years and uh, wanted to be married. Mm -hmm. And uh, his wife had, had other ideas later on in life, but um, loved his children. He's, he was angry for a long time. He was angry for a long time because <laughs> he, he did not want to get a divorce. But to make a long story short, he was behind on his child support payments mm -hmm. because he lost his job. And he never, I, I realize now that he never went down to report that he was no longer working. Right, to so, get a modification. Right, so he ended up getting arrested. Wow. And she was one of these sisters that'd be like, can I charge him for this? Can I charge him for that? Can I take this? She, she was one of those kind of sisters. Can I snatch his, uh, his tonsils out? Mm -hmm. You know, just, she, <laughs> she was so bad that the children had to go to her and say, just leave him alone. That's, right. I mean, that's how bad she was. And, of course, he's trying to get the money to pay. But every time I, I think about it, I think about if he had had your workshop, mm -hmm. <laughs> that he, he could have better understood some of his rights. And yeah. It, 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 you know, yeah, he, and older guys can come to all our stuff. Like right. I was saying before that, what I, what I meant before, that the older fathers can't enroll in the programs uh -huh. because, you know, 
we're we're a small organization. We're not. We can't take on as as much as a large organization may be able to take take on. Right. But these older guys can go to well, all our I workshops. Mean, I they mean, get the information. That yeah, you yeah, yeah. They can yeah. definitely do that because right. a lot of guys don't understand that. Right. Like that guy right there. Right. That gentleman. Yeah. He could have went and got a modification. Let him know he wasn't working. He right. lost his job and got a modification, but. Right. Child support not going to come to you. You right, have to right. go to them. Right. Exactly. So that's why we inform fathers. They have to do this. Right. You know, they they have to do this. And yeah. and I and I was talking to a guy the other day, a couple couple days ago, and I was and I was kind of surprised that years ago when they calculated the formula for child support, mm -hmm. and if the mother was unemployed, they calculated zero mm -hmm. as far as the formula, and they just used the father income. Right. Since 2009, that changed, and the laws have changed, and so now women they have to get at least a minimum wage job. Oh, okay. In the state of Florida, Chuck, they got to be 80 percent of guys who never, who are still paying the same thing, and the mother, she don't have a job, mm -hmm. even though she's supposed to have a job. Right. Because one thing people don't understand, child support don't follow up like that. They, they're they oh, not going to no. follow up uh -huh. and make sure that you know this and you know that. And it, it, Actually, some women don't even know that they're supposed to have at least a minimum wage job. You know, because with the child support, they don't have like, you know, if you have a certain profession and you every year you got to go renew your license and all that, they don't have that with child support. Mm -hmm. Your first court order, whatever that court order is, that goes... The only time that they come in is when the guy's not paying and is reported. So we let our guys know all the time that make sure that you stay up with the certain laws, like Statute 61. Mm -hmm. You know, stay abreast, you know, stay knowledgeable on, on these changing laws because it affects what you have to pay. Years ago, they didn't, if a guy paid health care, uh -huh. they didn't calculate that in a formula. Now they do. Daycare, they didn't calculate it in a formula. Now they do. And the sad thing about it is, is that there's professionals running around here. There's professionals that don't know this. Social workers, uh -huh. educators, people who are supposed to know all this. So they te they still telling people the way it used to be. Right. They give them bad information every day. So that's why, you know, the main people that should be coming to this conference is social workers. Wow. That's for sure. The main people should be coming into this conference is social workers. And what kills me too is that when you get these professionals, educated social worker, whatever, oh, my job won't pay for it. There's times I would go to conference and if and if it was if I was able to afford it, I would go myself. Right. So I can know more. I can understand more. Right. You know, and but yeah. oh, oh my job won't pay for it. I said, would your job give you time off to go if you pay for it yourself? Yeah. Right. So we have people in our communities walking around, professionals, telling lies. Or I ain't saying they lying to lie. They giving misinformation. Right. Let me put it like that. They, <laughs> it's misinformation. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I'm coming to the end here. So hit us up on the conference again, the time and the place. It's um, at Holden Heights Community Center. Mm -hmm. It's an all-day conference. Starts at 8.30, ends at 4.00. February 25th and 6th. That's Thursday and Friday. Mm. All right. Well, we'll All right. We have a breakfast and we have a recognition luncheon. Um, the conference fee covers all of that. So it's, it's a good deal. All right. Well, cool, In cool. In cool. All right. Chuck, as long as you've been knowing me, you, you know, some some people out there call me stuff. They, I got special, especially the seniors. Hey, Mr. Hakeem. I was like, I, I just get tired. All right, all right, Mr. Williams. Hey, Mr. Hakeem. All right, we want to thank you for coming on the show. Very important conference coming up. Make sure that you uh, find out some more information about it. If you can attend, please do so. Dr. Robinson will be back with us next week, so we want to thank you for tuning in and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.